Putin said to Vladimir Zelensky with his message for Vladimir Putin while commemorating D-Day. Back here at home, Hunter Biden heads into the weekend with a major decision to make. Will he or won't he testify in his own criminal case? Plus, a big win for the U.S. economy. Or is it? What today's jobs report reveals about who's getting to work and for how long. Also tonight, Paris puts up the Olympic rings as the world is set to come together later this summer. American lawmakers jump out of a plane in France. We'll be speaking with one to ask why. And Pat Sajak spinning into retirement as he is set to say au revoir to Wheel of Fortune. Come on in. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. And welcome to Washington Tonight. I'm Blake Berman. First from the Hill this evening, the commander in chief with a message on the world stage while also facing questions both abroad and here at home. President Biden commemorating D-Day from Pointe de Hoc, France, where Army Rangers heroically scaled towering seaside cliffs 80 years ago. The president touting the ideals of American democracy and the need to take on Vladimir Putin. Before that speech, the president apologized to Ukraine's president for Congress's funding delay. I apologize for the uh, those weeks of not knowing what's going to happen in terms of funding. I assure you, the United States is going to stand with you. Now it comes as we are likely to see a show of force from Russia next week, as four Russian ships, including a nuclear-powered submarine, are expected to arrive just 90 miles off the coast of Florida in Havana, Cuba. But as the commander-in-chief was abroad, a different reminder as well of the political challenges he's facing here at home. For example, headline in the Hill this week, NAACP urges Biden to halt weapons to Israel to build black voter support. While the Washington Post reports the Hollywood star George Clooney called the White House to complain about the administration's denouncement of the International Criminal Court's treatment of Israel, of which his wife supported Joining us today, Chris Steyerwald, host of The Hill Sunday, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Julia Manchester is the national political reporter for The Hill. Scott Bolden, News Nation contributor. And Aaron Perini, a Republican strategist. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in on this Friday. Um, the president abroad, of course, commemorating D-Day. And we, we saw him in France yesterday, saw him in France today. He'll, he'll be abroad for a couple days. But Chris, when you sort of lay out where we are right now in the world and the challenges back here at home, he's got a lot on his plate. And I think that right there just showed some of the pickle that, that the president has right now. It is a pickle, but this is, of course, the best stage. This is uh, <laughs> short of the State of the Union address. This is the best stage. This is a unifying thing for Americans. It's a common point of heroism. And it lines up with Biden's message on Ukraine, on the United States leading role in the world. So this is, a, if you're the president, this is a good day. What about the message he gave today? Because as Chris points out, it was about American democracy, which you want to talk about, of course, and spread that idea, but it's also a campaign theme, right? Absolutely. But he also went to the Vlad to Vladimir Putin and Russia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is very much him trying to go to a historic place where Americans, allied powers, um, you know, our allies back then met with us there today and yesterday. And he's trying to bring that message to the future, saying, once again, our Western ideals, our Western um, you know, way of life is under threat in a way from Russia. But one other thing I really noticed, mm -hmm. and piggybacking off of Chris's uh, note about the world stage, this is a very good way for Biden to draw a contrast with Donald Trump in many Many ways to say, look, I am with the big players here in um, on the world stage. I'm talking about this, but also he went to a place that Ronald Reagan yeah. addressed 40 years ago, and in a way, it's a subtle nod to the Republican Party so, prior to Trump. So it was a, a nod to the Republican Party, right? Because Republicans, Aaron, voted against, by and large, the Ukraine aid here in Washington. We hear the Commander in Chief in France today say, "We need to stand up." To Ukraine, we need to stand up to Russia. We need to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Didn't it kind of expose, in a way, Republicans and Ukraine and sort of maybe the rift there? 
The problem with Ukraine that Republicans have had, especially on the Hill, is the lack of a strategy or anything from the administration to show that they have a focus other than continuing to ask for money. So that is where they want the accountability. But on the world stage, you're still seeing Russia bringing ships into yep. Cuba. You're still seeing a president who Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense under Obama, said was on the wrong side of history on every foreign affairs issue for over 40 years. It's been a few years since he said that, but it's not getting any better for Biden, even if he's trying to have his gipper moment in Normandy and he's standing at Ponte Hawk, he doesn't deliver it the way Reagan did. So while he's trying to play that, it's not landing. So how do Republicans then say, you know what, now's the time to push back against Putin. Look what's happening off the coast of Florida if what happened here, I mean, everyone saw what happened here in Washington and, and that funding fight. Well, Republicans have always wanted to push back against Putin. That's why you saw Republicans like Senator Ted Cruz stand up against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and understanding that allowing more natural gas access was only going to embolden Putin. And what do you know? Biden capitulated on it. They could circumvent Germany. And so now they can circumvent Ukraine to get gas to Germany. And that's where this war started. But, but, but that's what Repub Republicans have always stood against Putin. That's not new. So it's, back always, it's always Biden's fault. He gets I mean, that for everything. Is. It's always Biden's fault. And it's like a broken record. Here, here's the irony of, of what I've seen today. One, uh, both Ronald Reagan who was a uh, conservative Republican traditionally, was a globalist, and so is uh, Biden. And whatever, um, whatever um, uh, Reagan was dealing with, with Gorbachev, you still have that same setup here with uh, Putin and the aggression towards Ukraine. Secondly, it's ironic that many of these issues that we're talking about on the international stage are, are coming home are still uh, domestic issues so for Biden. So speaking that of is the NAACP, yeah, so speaking of that, young people. Do you want the NAACP getting involved in Middle Eastern affairs? Do you want Hollywood stars like George Clooney getting involved in Middle Eastern affairs? Well, because they're pushing the White House and they're pushing the yeah, president. They're, they're pushing the White House because they and several other countries don't like how Israel has implemented the war. It's not that they don't stand with Israel. I understand they why, like but, that should, but should they? Well, they've got a right to express their opinion. I don't think they're uh, changing policy or driving policy on the international front, but they certainly can express their views and what their constituencies are telling them. Okay. All right. Joining us now is William Cohen. As you might know, he was the defense secretary under President Bill Clinton. He also served as a Republican congressman and senator from the state of Maine. Mr. Cohen, thanks for being with us here on the Great Hill. To be with it you. Is Thank you. Yes, no, it is, it is a, an honor and a pleasure to have you. Um, as we sit back here, sir, and sort of examine what's going on across the world, Scott was just talking about Israel, uh, Aaron was just talking about Russia, Chris and, and Julia too. I, I wonder sort of as you survey the landscape where, where your attention is right now and what you're focused on. Well, uh, the world's in a state of turbulence, to be sure. And that's why the United States has to be the galvanizing force. The president gave a speech, which I think was passionate and really on point. Think of those older soldiers who were there today in the sunset of their years. They were young right. ones. They were handsome. They were scaling those heights. They were storming the beaches. And you draw a split screen between what you saw today and then what you saw the mob storming Capitol Hill. And that's what's going on in this country from one then. And we had a former president, by the way, when your, uh, one of your hosts said the Republicans have always been against Putin. President Trump, when he was President Trump, said Putin can do whatever the hell he wants in Europe. That's what sends the scare message through Europe, saying Putin can do whatever he wants, and he can do it in Ukraine, he can do it in Poland, he can do it in Lithuania, he can do it in Sweden. That's what they're afraid of, and what they want is the United States to say no. We fought like hell. We sacrificed like hell to make sure that Europeans and the United States could sleep under the blanket of freedom. I, That's what's at stake here. And anyone I who says, you. well, Republicans are just you know, are trying to complain about uh, Biden. No, it's not Biden. It's about whether we believe in democracy versus uh, a tyranny, which I hear uh, you, sir. Yes. yes, I hear you, sir, on Donald Trump. What about President Biden today going abroad, speaking mm -hmm. to the Ukrainian leader and apologizing? Do you take issue with that? No, I don't. I think that uh, he was apologizing because we have been late 
in getting the right equipment to the Ukrainians when they needed it. It's coming in now, but they're on their heels instead of being on their toes. So, yes, I think he uh, he was right in saying, uh, Mr. President, I wish we had acted sooner. Uh, we didn't. We're I'm pledging to you as long as I am in office. And that is the contingency here, because the Europeans know that if President Trump uh, or Mr. Trump comes back into office, there will be very little support for NATO. He will have tr- uh, Putin drive through uh, Ukraine and give them up overnight. So that's speaking what they're of, afraid of. And that's why of Putin, I, it, it was important that he speak there today. Speaking of Putin, as a former defense secretary, what do you think he's doing here? He is sending, I mean, when you talk about Cuba, Cuba yeah. is 90 miles south of Florida. It, the distance from Havana to Miami is basically the same distance from D.C. to New York. And he's sending in four ships into the port there in Havana, expected to be there next week. What do you think he's doing? I think he's sending a signal that if the United States can provide weapons to the Ukrainians that can strike Russian territory, uh, I can put uh, ships in, uh, in Havana. The problem is this is a, one, a one-timer, hopefully that we not allow it to be normalized or regularized. At that particular point, I think the United States has another a number of options that we can send signals to Russia. Now, we can come very close to your territory. We can uh, hmm. put other types of weapons close to you or closer to hmm. you. You don't want to do this. Let's not escalate this now. And so, uh, yes, he's sending a signal. Uh, in the meantime, I don't think we should send a public signal yet, but I think privately there needs to be a conversation taking place. Do you worry about escalation? Because what I just heard from you, I'm not saying it would lead to escalation, but there is certainly a world uh, that exists that if the commander in chief sort of takes that advice or goes down that path, that escalation with Russia could occur. I think he always has that choice. What I'm saying is he need not do anything publicly or say anything publicly. But if Putin starts to make regular trips into Havana, we almost went to war those 13 days during the Kennedy administration when we were on the edge of a nuclear war with Russia, with the Soviet Union. We don't want to go down that path. But if Putin starts to put things in Havana, if he starts showing up with more ships on a regular basis, I think at that particular point, the president, our president has a, an opportunity and an obligation to send a signal to Putin. You don't want to do this because you're going to escalate it. And we're certainly we have certainly have the capability of making life very bad for you. William Cohen, uh, former defense secretary, it is a, it is great to speak with you and, and hear your perspective. Have a great weekend, sir. And we hope you, you come you. on back here to the Hill. Thank you. OK, bye bye. Um, I wonder what you make of what you just heard from William Cohen there, because we're going to see Russian warships essentially off the coast of the U.S. potentially next week. Well, we assume, I think we can reasonably assume, that Vladimir Putin has a rooting interest in this presidential election. Uh, And uh, it would be very bad for Donald Trump if Vladimir Putin were to menace the United States in that way. So if Putin is interested in Donald Trump winning, the last thing that he should do is to bring the Soviet, I'm sorry. (laughs) Russian. (laughs) Uh, 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 Sorry. Uh, Bring the Russian military within the Caribbean Ocean and within 90 miles of the U.S. coast because the United States would rally behind the commander in chief. And it would, for a lot of reasons, it would be uh, a, a bad move for the Russians. But also in terms of how it would affect the presidential election. All right. Meantime, a group of 10 lawmakers, all veterans, uh, speaking of the D-Day celebrations and, and what's gone on there in France over the last couple of days, parachuted out of a World War II era plane to commemorate D-Day in Normandy today. This is the video right here. Check it out. Uh, from one member who jumped, the Georgia Congressman Rich McCormick, a Marine and Navy veteran. They went in an, in an old, old plane, and you can see there over the, in the skies of France, parachuting. Joining us live from France right now is Congressman McCormick and uh, a couple members of, of con- who, who sit next to you, Congressman. I, I think that's Congressman Mills to one side and apologies to who's on your other side. So I got Ronnie Jackson from Texas and I got Corey Mills from uh, Florida. There you, there you go. I remember Ronnie Jackson, but not with the hat on, I guess, in a van in the middle of the night in France. So excuse me. Uh, but it, amazing what you did, Congressman, a bipartisan group of lawmakers. Why did you feel the need to do what you did? This is the 80th anniversary. Every five years they have a big anniversary. 
uh, five years from now, the youngest guy will be 101. They're almost all gone. Huh. This is something uh, special. Uh, you think about these guys, they're teenagers, they're going over the middle of the night. These airborne missions, you got teenagers who maybe had two jumps. Uh, they're going up in an aircraft that's being shot at, trying to be shot out of the sky. Uh, they're, they're falling through the air at nighttime. They can't even see that we're going to land. They land somewhere that the loneliest feeling you can ever have when you don't know where anybody is or where you're supposed to go. And then you uh, had 12,000 casualties over the course of a war just in the airborne units we had. Yeah. Uh, in one day on D-Day, 2,500 casualties. That's more than we had in all of Afghanistan in 20 years. These guys really understood sacrifice. This is the greatest generation. We want to do them honor. And that's why it's great. You have, an, you have a Navy, an Army, and a Marine guy all sitting in front of you right now. I thought it was that important that we come back and uh, just pay tribute to them and uh, do something special. Democrats and Republicans, I should add, on that trip there in France. I believe, Congressman, we're looking at you somewhere in the sky up there. Talk about, talk about the thrill of jumping out of an old military plane um, to, to commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Oh, the C-47, the same C-47 that was over there doing the mission 80 years ago. I think wow. just flying up in that thing was just as dangerous as jumping out of it. Uh, you could see when we jumped out, uh, there was Corey Mills, was the two guy, uh, guys in front of me, Dan Croucher right in front of me, and then Ron, Ronnie Jackson was there too. And, and uh, we just all, as soon as I came out of the aircraft, my helmet flew off. It's fun, like, a funny video. If you're watching it, it would be terrifying because you'd think I was going to uh, plan it. But uh, just something fun. I mean, how often do people get to do something like this? Uh, yeah. It's just kind of a cool camaraderie thing. Do you, know, you think a congressman is just legislators? We're people. We like to hang out and, uh, and do things together, and, and especially when you got a couple of good guys from different branches of the service. Uh, it's just something special. You are uh, uh, just people, as you say, a member of Congress, also a veteran as well. Uh, congressman McCormick joining us live in a van in the middle of the night in France after jumping out of an airplane to commemorate D-Day. We thank you for your time, sir, and we'll talk to you again here soon on the Hill. Stay safe. Safe travels. Thanks, guys. Set for five. You got it. All right. Still to come here from the Hill over the next 44 minutes. What would Xi Jinping do? Stanford University professors, get this, they think artificial intelligence might know. One of the professors tells us on the other side of the break how they are trying to get inside the mind of the Chinese dictator, plus a major decision for Hunter Biden and his attorney. Will the president's son take to the stand in his own criminal trial? And coming up here on the Hill, Steyerwald going to be breaking down where Americans are right now on some of the big cultural issues of the day. <laughs> it's going to be good. I'm yeah, pretty we'll excited about it. Coming up about uh, 15 minutes from here, you're watching the Hill here on News Nation. Stay with us. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. So we are less than 50 days now away from the 2024 Paris Olympics, and the City of Light is marking the occasion with a new addition to the Eiffel Tower. Morning commuters were greeted by the five Olympic rings fastened to the iconic French structure. Would you look at that? Uh, around the table real quick. Aaron, what do you see there? The uh, Olympic rings going up there at the Eiffel Tower. I see two icons, the Eiffel Tower and the Olympic <laughs> rings. I'm so excited. Go USA. We're going to win everything. <laughs> Scott? I think it's awesome. There's a great restaurant at the top, too, by the oh, way. Oh, I'm sure you so know. You see that <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see hashtag sports. I'm not a huge sports expert. You're not, I, I go, I know you're not I, a big sport. I go, but like for, a, the vibe. You go for the vibe. There you go. Got anything? I'm a Boo Olympics person. You're a Boo Olympics so, person. Um, you know. Yeah, I know. I'm the worst. I stipulate on many. Uh, <laughs> uh, the site there in Paris, France, going up today. All right, now heading to China, where President Xi Jinping recently held two days of military drills near Taiwan, calling them, quote-unquote, strong punishment. China's latest move is increasing fears it might soon invade the island nation. But is there a way to potentially try to get inside the mind of Xi Jinping? Stanford University researchers are developing an artificial intelligence model to try and predict Xi's next military move. Now, it is still in the beginning stages, but the goal is to see if technology can try to figure out what would she do. Jacqueline Schneider is the director of the Hoover Wargaming and Crisis Simulation Initiative and joins us live. Jacqueline, I saw this. I read about this. This is fascinating to me. We think about artificial intelligence and what may or may not come next. Do you really think you can get inside the mind of Xi Jinping? And, and, and what are you all up to over there at Stanford? Tell me. Well, I don't think we can really get inside the mind of Xi Jinping. <laughs> But what we can do is we can use technology and war games and iteration in order to better understand the world of possibilities. 
Hmm. I'm not sure even Xi Jinping knows exactly what he's going to do in five years. But wow. war games help us understand the the potential outcomes, the ways in right. which things might evolve. What is more dangerous? What is less dangerous? And whether there are avenues or incidences that could lead are more likely to lead to war. So you know, you, you talk about war games, the Pentagon tabletop stuff all the time, stuff that that may be before them right now, or even years and decades down the line. Is this going to replace? What folks at the Pentagon, this meaning AI, and sort of what you're doing over there at Stanford, is this going to replace the table topping and, and war games that the Pentagon has been doing for years and decades in the past, or are we not there just yet? No, it'll never replace human, be- human players. Okay, but- that's good to know. <laughs> One of the limitations you have, though, when you're running war games is you have a limited amount of people who can play the adversary, that can play red, that can play China. And those people Hmm. are making guesses about Xi Jinping's behavior, making guesses about Chinese domestic politics. So if you run a game five times with the same five players, you might get a problem with bias. So what we're trying to do is actually be Hmm. complementary to what is already being done and trying to use technology to increase the amount of iteration to see the world of possible outcomes. Um, And and then we can compare it against the human behavior and say, hey, are are Americans that are playing China, are they playing it like Americans? Are they playing it like the Chinese? Something significantly different. So it's a really nice kind of complementary tool, but not a replacement to human players. Jacqueline, have you, have you, I'll leave you with this. Have you learned anything about Xi Jinping by doing this yourself personally? I mean, I think all we can say is that uh, the world of choices that Xi Jinping has uh, don't lend themselves easily to a model. Okay, we'll leave it there. Uh, Jacqueline Schneider over at Stanford using AI to potentially see what she might do next. Jacqueline, we thank you so much for the time. Uh, Appreciate it. Thanks for being with us here on The Hill. Sure, no problem. You got to wonder, Julia, like where all this goes, right? Like we're already talking about AI fighter jets instead of pilots. And they're trying to do something that I think is fairly novel. Absolutely. Is trying to predict where these world leaders might head next. Absolutely. And it's like they're almost trying to get out ahead of China because we know that China is also looking to invest in AI. So this is interesting. But I'm curious to see whether there's someone like Jacqueline Schneider in China trying to do the the same to Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And why limit this to Xi Jinping? Like you could if you're anyone who's been out on the stage enough, an an athlete, a business leader, a world leader, like in theory, you could do this for anyone. Or stock market, if you will. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like take all of, like try to predict what Jamie Dimon does. As you were interviewing um, her, the fellow, the Hoover fellow, I was thinking, okay, well, it's just a war game. You're not just doing this just to do this. So how do you measure your success? How do you get more sophisticated? What's reliable? What is it? And then what do you do with all of this information? Share with the government or private or what? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, look, I think we're on the infancy of all this. And these are the conversations to have in the years and days to come. But it's fascinating to hear what they're doing there trying to figure out what she might do next. All right, there's still much more ahead here on the Hill. A big beat for the economy, but did we also get a big warning sign? Coming up, I'll take you beyond the headline to try to explain what was inside today's jobs report. Plus, Steyerwald will be breaking down some of the key cultural issues in the election, along with there's one state in particular it suddenly popped up on our radar. You know, as you were talking, it occurred to me that Berman means business. That's, it, that, that's, they want to that, give that, me that name, but I've I don't know that I want to take it. I'm out here pushing it. I'm selling in America. <laughs> Berman means business, and it's a fact. It's, it's debatable, fact. but Steyerwald can break it down. <laughs> I will break. Chris is on the other side of the break. You're watching The Hill. That's right. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. So if you look at this headline right here, it is no doubt one you like to see. The Labor Department says the U.S. economy added 272,000 jobs last month, with the unemployment rate barely ticking up to 4%, which, by the way, is still very close to historic lows. In a statement today, in part, President Biden saying, quote, the great American comeback continues. However, if you look under the hood for a moment, there are real questions to ask about the strength of the job market. For example, the survey shows the number of full-time workers actually declined by, get this, 625,000, while the number of part-time workers increased by 286,000. Right now, the number of people who are not working, are underemployed, or have just given up looking for work, 
That number is at 7.4%. By the way, it's also rising. What now, we have been reporting here on the Hill for months now how immigration trends, no matter what you make of it politically one way or another, are potentially helping the economy. And the numbers from last month seem to bear that out. In May, 414,000 immigrants, whether they came to the United States legally or illegally, said they gained a job. However, 663,000 Americans who were born in the United States said they lost their job. The economy and the border, of course, are the two top issues of importance to voters, according to the polls, at least at this point in time. And now there is further evidence of how big the divide is among Democrats and Republicans on many cultural issues. So what impact could this potentially have in this year's election? Styrol here to break it all down. Chris. We have the goods. Well, we also have my parking parking ticket. (laughs) (laughs) See if you can get that validated. See if anybody can get that validated for me. Okay. Uh, The Pew Research Center uh, is a primo provider of polling. Uh, We like their stuff. And this presidential election, being a rematch with so few undecided voters, wedge issues, social and cultural issues are extraordinarily important for doing two things. To motivate your base... Uh, to get them to stay voting with you and to go out and and do it, and then to persuade. So that's what social issues do. They both motivate and they persuade, but by how much and in which direction. So first question, abortion should be legal in most slash all cases is your first beautiful graphic. Okay, among Biden supporters, 88%. Among Trump supporters, 38%. Maybe not surprising. I mean, that is a pretty significant minority among Republicans who are in the pro-choice camp. Where do the majority of voters fall? 62%. So that's a, a, a heavy lean in favor of the Democratic position there. So that's a wedge issue that stacks up well, as we know, and we've seen for Democrats. But what about another issue? Gender is determined by sex assigned at birth. Oh, okay. So this one flips it around. 90% of Trump voters are uh, agree uh, but a surprisingly large plurality or a su- surprisingly large minority of Biden supporters may be due. Where is the main line of the electorate on this staunchly on the Republican side? So that's where that goes. Now, look at the last one. White people benefit a great deal from advantages in society black people don't have. Where are the voters on this one? Now, they're very close to even the the other respondents. This is a clear majority because the rest of the responses break up into multiple groups. Uh, But all voters are closer to Democrats on this question. The point here out of all of this stuff, as candidates go to try to compete for the small number of persuadable voters in the middle, it's these issues that will create the stopping points for people in the base from defecting, right? So as you say, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm going to vote for RFK. Maybe I'm going to do this. These are the issues where you're going to keep your base together. But it's also the point, and to particularly think about how stuff like the uh, transgenderism and uh, abortion will affect uh, the availability of those voters. Those are numbers. Sty- I gave them to you. Styrol breaks it down. Um, we also have some new polling out, by the way, in the recent days, and a lot of this is post-Trump verdict. I want to sh- show what's what's going on in the state of Virginia, a state that we didn't really think was in play or wouldn't be in play a couple years ago. And would you look at this? Essentially a dead tie, 48-48. Donald Trump playing in Virginia, Aaron. Why? How? Well, what's this all about? <laughs> it's early. I think there are a couple of cases that can be made here. One, Democrats haven't fully come home to the base for, for Joe Biden yet. There's still discontent within the party that you're seeing there. Two, this is reflective upon where people stand today, which is they don't feel good about the economy. They don't feel good about the security of our nation. That's being reflected in these polls. This is still much more of a bluish purple Virginia than okay. it is a true purple Virginia. But these are numbers that show that the Republican message is resonating. Where are you, Scott? Um... I offer my colleague a friendly amendment. Okay. This is all about... It's never Northern, that friendly. Uh, it's friendly. I'm <laughs> no, smiling. It's friendly. I'm <laughs> smiling. It's always friendly. Well, not always, but, it, but it's always friendly. Um, this is all about Northern Virginia versus everybody else in Virginia. Right. It's always like New York. It, it, <laughs> exactly. And so uh, I think um, Aaron is right about this is a snapshot. Again, I think in the Democrats' theory on all of this is when, when they start to focus and they have two choices, right, and the get-out-the-vote 
vote campaigns are in full thrust, Mm -hmm. that most of Americans are going to vote for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. If the Democrats don't have a huge turnout, right, Right. Donald Trump's going to win this race. What's going on there? Look, in terms of this obviously comes out to turnout. Obviously, if the Democrats are hyped up, Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, Richmond, if they get the turnout up there, that's great. But what Donald Trump needs to do is essentially do what Glenn Youngkin did in 2021 Mm -hmm. and really run up the score, not only focusing on some of these swing areas where there are Republicans, but in rural Virginia. Very much try to get that rural vote out. Youngkin did a very good job of that in 2021. Let's talk Virginia and Florida real quick. Let's start Virginia. What's going on? Uh, If Donald Trump could be normal... He would win so, easily. Yeah. He would, exactly. Donald, if Donald yeah. Trump could, and you know I call this the uh, Han Solo election for Donald Trump, okay. if he could be frozen in carbonite <laughs> and wheeled away, he would beat Joe Biden in the popular vote. He okay. would win a 320-seat electoral college landslide. But, and we keep seeing Trump do this, this is how good the moment is for Donald Trump right now. But he's out, he gives these interviews, he talks about retribution, he says all the wrong stuff, he confuses the thing. And those, so everything everybody said about Virginia is right. It's all true. Uh, and thank you for the, allude to the Richmond suburbs are important too. We see, <laughs> we see you, Henrico County. We validate you. <laughs> but I will just say... These are the same voters that would love for Joe Biden not to be president, right. but then Donald Trump is going to make it impossible for them to vote for him. And that he can't do what Glenn Youngkin did because Glenn Youngkin was really good and reassuring to those voters. He had his little vest on and normal. he was cool and he was super normal. And people said, OK, this guy's fine. He doesn't worry me. By the way, you were just talking about cultural issues and not that these are straight up cult- cultural issues per se. But in the state of Florida, we also saw some polling Trump plus four, which I found maybe tighter than I expected it to be. And in that state this year on the ballot, marijuana and abortion. Oh, yeah. Right? So I wonder, like... Well, another thing is in Florida, though, they do have a history of voting for liberal ballot amendments yeah. while at the same time electing Republicans. So sort of interesting. Did, did you, any, any worries on Florida for you, Republican not perspective? A, no, not as a Because four, like, four is not like eight or nine. It's a little tighter than I thought it would be. I, I mean... A, Yes, but again, it's the snapshot in time that we're looking at at this point. Four points is still probably just outside the margin of error if we're looking at the poll. And this is what Democrats do, and they do it generally pretty well in states, is they put ballot initiatives out there. But to Julia's point, Florida's a state that'll split the vote. All right, coming up here on the Hill, the prosecution rests. Hunter Biden's federal gun trial is winding down, but will the president's son take the stand? Plus, should Donald Trump... Be on a five hundred dollar bill. Come on, this is what you love. <laughs> yeah. Come on, this is an, I, I guess that was my question, but this is something that a lawmaker is actually proposing. Part of the reason why we're talking about it. You're watching the Hill. You're on News Nation. That sounds like a yes. Government is not the solution to our problem. Reagan, like you've never seen before. Government is the problem. The words, images, and the history that changed the world. Portrait of a Presidency. Tomorrow, 9, 8 central on News Nation. On trial, the prosecution resting its case and the defense calling Hunter Biden's daughter, Naomi Biden. Now, President Biden's brother, James Biden, went to court but was not called to the stand. It is not known if Hunter Biden will testify or not. The defense has the weekend to decide. They essentially got to give an answer come Monday. Scott. So the prosecution feels good. I didn't even get the chance to ask one question. <laughs> <laughs> no, go, go, go. 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 Yeah. I thought I heard a question. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I think the prosecution at the end of their case always feels good, if you will, whether okay. it's Trump or Hunter Biden. The defense has two questions to answer over the weekend. One, do, do they believe that the prosecution has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt? Okay. This is a pretty straightforward case. I think they probably have. Uh, secondly, um, does Hunter Biden testifying help or hurt, real or potentially, the defense in this case? Do they need him? Do they need him to get on and tell their story? Because he's going to be subject to cross-examination, right. and only Abby Lowell and his team can figure okay, that out. Okay, so you bring up Abby Lowell. That was the, the second question I was going to ask you. I have Scott Bolden sitting here. Scott Bolden, if you're arguing the case, you're advising Hunter Biden testify yes or no. If I, 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 I advise if I can prep him, right, for cross mm-hmm. as well as direct and there's some emotion behind it whereby he says, I didn't do this, I didn't check it off, and right. it was manipulated, then I'm probably 70% to 30% going to put him on. Because okay. I think he, he appeals, this drug addiction issue appeals to family, the, the family okay. and emotional issues. You mentioned Abby Lowell. You know Abby Lowell, mm-hmm. I believe, right? Yeah. Abby Lowell is Hunter Biden's attorney. Mm-hmm. What do you think 
Abby Lowell will decide. I, I, I can't predict that, but I do know this. Abby is one of the most aggressive criminal defense lawyers out there, but he is super smart, too. And I think Hunter Biden is going to listen to him because you remember six months to a year ago, Hunter Biden's strategy changed. Uh, Abby yeah. Lowell took it over and they've been very, very aggressive. And remember what I said a few weeks ago, this case is being tried for the appellate court because the appellate court is the big poss- great probability they're going to strike this down as being unconstitutional. That provision that you can't own a gun while right. you're if you're on drugs. And at the moment, at the moment he filled that out, did he believe in his heart of hearts that he was a drug addict or not? He could answer that no, and that gets reversed, and he's more than within his right and the law and the jury instructions to be able to say that. Real quick, you, you, you think he's convicted? No. I think he's got more than a 50-50 okay. shot because of all the factors that I raised in this in our colloquy. Resident counselor. <laughs> our colloquy. Uh, you know he's in trouble when he's down to colloquy. When, he's down, when, he, when he gets to colloquy, that's when you know. All right. Well, I've got these haters Jefferson, on the panel Jackson, today. You know what Blake? Grant and Trump. What connects those six former presidents? Well, if Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar has his way, they will all have their portraits fe- featured on American currency. The congressman has actually introduced new legislation titled the Treasury Reserved Unveiling Mem- uh, Memorable Portrait Act, uh, or the Trump Act of 2024. <laughs> now, if passed, it would put Donald Trump's face on the $500 <laughs> bill. Go to Chris first. Uh, yeah. No, no, I nobody, hear nobody, wa- nobody wants <laughs> to. If I, if I don't even like the Olympics, imagine <laughs> what I want to say about this. It's yeah. like a cutesy move by a congressman to, like, cozy, like, say, look, I, I love Trump. You know, this is something Paul Gosar would do. Right. I don't know what's, you know. What, what I does think that's Trump the answer. have? Yeah, I don't know right, what else right. to say. <laughs> but what is Trump? Trump must have pictures on Gosar or something. I mean, this is, like, really, really... Um, I think you underestimate some level of fidelity that some Republicans have to Donald, Donald Trump, Trump, that yeah. they would use the acronym Trump in legislation. I can't even probably count <laughs> way, on two hands how many members have probably tried to figure out legislation they could introduce yes. that the acronym would yes. be Trump. So I, I would note, and, or I would predict, that there this won't happen, but like there will be schools named after Donald Trump. There yeah. will be, at some point in time, there will be airports or airport named after Donald Trump, just like it's already happened with Barack Obama, George W. Bush presidents right. in the yep. recent oh. decade, and then in, uh, of course, other presidents past. By the way, <laughs> did you know that there was once a $100,000 bill? Do you know um, which president was featured on that? Woodrow Wilson. It's, there you go! <laughs> It never made it into circulation, printed between 1934 and 35. In case you were wondering, $100,000 back then is essentially equivalent to $2.2 million today. So they had the idea of essentially, a, at the time, a multi-million dollar bill. Never made it into circulation, though. All right, an American icon, speaking of money, retires tonight. After four decades, Pat Sajak is stepping down as host of Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune exploded in popularity since Sajak take, uh, took over with his uh, teammate there, Vanna White. Sajak took over Wheel of Fortune in 1981. Did you know back then? Of course you knew. Ronald Reagan was in his first year of president. Some other facts here. A gallon of milk was a buck 83. A regular gallon of gas in 1981 was $1.35. Mm. Really? Yeah, that seemed high to me, too. High, high yeah. right? Yeah, I didn't think... I'd, wouldn't have thought it was that high. Uh, Dallas, by the way, was the top-rated TV show. Speaking of TV shows, you uh, you do a good one on Sunday mornings, 10 o'clock oh, Eastern. Yes. Tell me about it. Oh, yes. Well, we've got Jim Clyburn, uh, Congressman, the, de- yep. the dean of the Democratic uh, uh, delegation from South Carolina. We're going to talk to him about that. We've got some. We've got Republicans. We've got an all-journalist panel. We have excellence. It's going to be great. Jim Clyburn arguably responsible for President Biden being President mm-hmm. Biden. And Barack Obama. Yep. Also, mm-hmm. because South Carolina is the place where black voters yeah. in the Democratic Party have their first and most potent, they they, they sting uh, and have their effect most of all. And, you know, we know the famous story of Jim Clyburn and Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton was so mad at him that he backed Barack Obama. He called him up to cuss him. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> I, I, and I, Jim Clyburn's recollection, that is a funny one. So as the as the semi-Florida man here on the, on the panel, I, uh, on the show, I was, I was looking at the Florida numbers last night, the polling that we were referencing. Let me show that real quick. The black vote in Florida right now, again, all hypothetical, but it kind of shows the problem that President Biden has and maybe the benefit that Donald Trump has right now, because in a five-way vote in that state, Joe Biden only for the moment at least has 56 percent 
of the black vote, it, it, it ticks up about another 10 points when you do it in a two-way, but the balance could potentially look something like that. And Julia, that sort of outlines the issue right there for for President Biden or one of them. Yeah, and look, when we talk about this multi-way race with the third-party candidates, I think RFK Jr., if he hasn't gotten on the ballot yet in Florida, he says he's close. So that's mm-hmm. definitely an issue, particularly, like you said, with black voters. In the, in the he's not on the ballot in Florida yet. N- I not don't that think I understand. Yeah, but he's getting close. But the other two candidates are, are minuscule, and, and Florida's not a swing state, right? Okay. Democrats love to have Texas and Florida. We keep fantasizing about it, but, we, but, but we're not. And so if he loses Florida, Biden can still win. To Scott's point that the other people outside of RFK, Trump and Biden are just minuscule, this is going to be a neck and neck race right. all the way to election day. That minusculeness that you see, anybody that splits a vote any which direction, that could really be a deciding factor in the outcome in November. The Hill Sunday with Chris Steyerwall, 10 o'clock Eastern in the morning. You won't want to miss it. But before then and coming up here on The Hill... With President Biden in France for the anniversary of D-Day, is he trying to take a page out of American history from the playbook of Ronald Reagan? Leland Vitter with us on the other side of the break. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. So President Biden delivered a speech at Point de Hoc in Normandy earlier today, where he discussed democracy at home and abroad. It echoed a similar speech that President Reagan gave in that same place 40 years ago. News Nation, as you might know, is airing an original documentary on Reagan this weekend, tomorrow night. Here's a preview. Uh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> did you get that piece? Yeah. You did, huh? The ranch was a place that Ronald could spend quality time with his wife, Nancy. I've got an idea for another picture. I've got the chainsaw. No, and you're blocking me off. <laughs> Stopping me <laughs> from... Don't just stand there. You're supposed to be saying, no, I'm not going to start the saw. (laughs) (laughs) They loved riding horses together. Come, Mrs. R. This is not for me, honey. But Mrs. R didn't much care for the heat. He likes 110. Reagan, Portrait of a Presiden- Presidency, airs tomorrow night right here on News Nation, 9 o'clock Eastern. Leland Vitter, host of On Balance. It is so cool to see that stuff. This is the second it, one of these now. I've it is. In advance. What's so nice is that we now have 40 years. We now yeah. have a long lens of history to look back. And I think in the same way that we look back on D-Day and now realize mm-hmm. it was a 